Welcome to the Culture of Healthcare, an overview of the culture of healthcare. This is Lecture A. The component, the culture of healthcare, addresses job expectations in healthcare settings. It discusses how care is organized within a practice setting, privacy laws, and professional and ethical issues encountered in the workplace. The objectives for an overview of the culture of healthcare are Distinguish between disease and illness. Discuss the relationship between health and the healthcare system. Define culture in the classic sense as well as in the modern sense of the term and what it means for culture to be partial, plural, and relative. Explain the concept of cultural competence. Explain the concepts and distinguish between culture and cultural safety and safety culture as applied to organizations. Be aware of the multiple cultures that interact in healthcare delivery. Define acculturation and how it relates to working in healthcare settings. Be able to give examples of health informatics applications of the study of culture. Welcome. This is the first of two lectures which serve as an introduction to the culture of healthcare and healthcare professionals. It is meant as an introductory unit for a full course on the culture of healthcare, covering the people who work in healthcare, the settings in which healthcare is delivered, the practices and processes of healthcare delivery, some of the professional values, beliefs, and ethics which drive that behavior, and how health information technologies interact with healthcare professionals in their work. In this first lecture, we will discuss what is meant by the word culture when we talk about healthcare and healthcare professionals. In a second lecture, we will discuss why this is important and how we can learn more about it. We talk a lot about healthcare, healthcare professionals, health information technology, but what do we mean by these terms? First, let's define disease and illness. Kleinman, in an often cited 1978 article, emphasized the distinction between disease and illness. According to Kleinman, when we talk about disease, we are referring to malfunction or maladaptation of biologic or physiologic processes. This is the traditional focus of physicians when they diagnose and treat disease. But Kleinman emphasizes the importance of illness by referring to the individual experience of the person who is suffering, their personal, interpersonal, and cultural reactions to disease or discomfort. While disease is determined mainly by biologic and physiologic processes, illness is shaped by cultural factors that govern perception, labeling, explanation, and valuation of the experience. To truly take care of patients requires that health professionals take into account not only the manifestation and treatment of disease, but also the patient's experience of illness in a social and cultural context. We generally think of health as referring to the absence of disease, a state of complete wellness. But in reality, this is not exactly the case. Health is relative. Most people, in fact, experience mild symptoms of one sort or another fairly frequently, according to national surveys of healthy people. The anthropologist Catherine Bateson points out that health is essentially an artifact of culture, that is to say, the relatively long life expectancy and good health that most of us enjoy in modern societies is a relatively new phenomenon and is an artifact of our cultural practices and technologies. It is also important to understand the difference in healthcare between acute illness and chronic illness. With an acute illness, most of us expect that our symptoms will be short-lived and that eventually we will be restored to our previous normal health. Examples are things like a common cold, a mild infection, or a simple fracture. On the other hand, with chronic conditions such as high blood pressure or diabetes, we expect the condition will last indefinitely. In these situations, the goal cannot be to restore normal health, rather the goal of the patient and clinician alike is to maintain the highest level of function and the lowest degree of symptoms that can be obtained. Problems can arise when we confuse these 
For example, when a person with a chronic illness thinks of it as an acute illness and expects to be cured and restored back to their normal state. Part of the management process in these situations is to help a person change their thinking and revise their expectations. For many people with chronic conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, or asthma, health means that things are pretty stable, symptoms are not too troublesome, and the person is able to get on with their life and function normally, even if this requires medication. Now that we understand a little more about health, disease, and illness, we can think about what we mean by health care. When we look at health in the broadest sense, it is not just the result of health care or a health care system. It is the product of broader cultural and social factors. For example, think of the effects of food, sanitation, and housing, and how these have impacted our life expectancy and quality of life in the last century or so. Furthermore, if we think of health care as actions which are principally and explicitly directed at maintaining or restoring health, then it is still true that most health care happens outside of the health care system with actions taken by the patient, by family members, or by caregivers constituting between 70 and 90 percent of the health care that people receive. Kleinman, 1978. Hence, most illness episodes never enter the professional or folk domains. For health informatics professionals, one implication of this is that health information technologies need to reach beyond the conventional healthcare system and health professionals to patients and families if they are to reach their full potential. Finally, we can think of the healthcare system as a collection of structures and actions directed at delivering healthcare. This slide illustrates what we've been talking about. The chart shows the United States mortality data for the period between 1900 and 1963 for diseases including measles, scarlet fever, typhoid, whooping cough, and diphtheria. In modern times, these are all illnesses for which we have specific vaccines or medications to prevent or treat them. However, if you look at the graph, most of the improvement in mortality for these diseases happened before our modern treatments were available. Consider typhoid fever. It appears as a very dark blue line in the chart. Today, we treat this disease with antibiotics and can prevent it with an oral vaccine. But antibiotics only became available in the mid-20th century. And as you can see from the chart, Typhoid fever mortality declined about tenfold before antibiotics were ever available. The improvements were mainly due to improvements in sanitation, water supply, and housing. Even today, most of the deaths in persons who get treated are in those who are malnourished or otherwise in a weakened state. Similarly, mortality from measles fell substantially before the measles vaccine became available in the 1960s. Mortality from scarlet fever also fell dramatically before antibiotics became available in mid-century. The point here is that broad social and cultural factors such as improved sanitation, improved nutrition, and reduced overcrowding were the major contributors to reducing mortality due to these serious infectious diseases. Modern treatments delivered through the healthcare system have continued to improve things. Most of what we call health, in terms of longer life expectancy and better quality of life, is a result of other factors. This graphic makes a somewhat similar point about the care of chronic conditions. There is no question that the care of chronic conditions depends on the existence of modern healthcare technologies. Insulin and other medications for diabetes, antihypertensive medications for blood pressure, surgical or other interventions for hardening of the arteries. However, our contemporary understanding of how people with chronic conditions can achieve the best social and clinical outcomes is based on some variant of the chronic care model articulated by Wagner in 1998. In this model, the existence of treatments is important, but to take best advantage of them requires coordinated action that incorporates community-based resources and policies, organized and accessible health care services 
support for individual self-management, information systems, and decision support to assist clinicians and patients. All of these factors working together are needed to produce productive interactions between an informed and active patient in a prepared and proactive practice team. You can see that this chronic care model requires much more than a simple prescription or treatment based on an individual clinician-patient interaction. The graphic reminds us that health is not solely the product of the healthcare system, but the result of broader community and social factors brought to bear on individual conditions. It also reminds us that health information technology can facilitate many actions and interactions in the management of chronic diseases, not simply office-based episodes between clinician and patient. Finally, we need to come up with a definition of culture. We will refine our thinking about the concept of culture in a subsequent lecture, but for now we can use the definition provided by the Office of Minority Health in the Department of Health and Human Services. According to their definition, culture refers to the integrated patterns of human behavior that include the language, thought, communications, actions, customs, beliefs, values, and institutions of racial, ethnic, religious, or social groups. This is considered the conventional and historic definition that, until recently, most people have worked with. Another useful definition is this one from the Medical Subject Headings Index of the National Library of Medicine. According to this definition, culture is a collective expression for all behavior patterns acquired and socially transmitted through symbols. Culture includes customs, traditions, and language. Both these definitions help us think about what we must pay attention to if we are to study and understand healthcare culture. If we adapt those definitions to the healthcare system, we come up with these definitions of the culture of healthcare. Using the Department of Health and Human Services definition, it would be patterns of human behavior that include the language, thoughts, communications, actions, customs, beliefs, values, and institutions of the healthcare system. Using the National Library of Medicine definition, it would be behavior patterns in the healthcare system which are acquired and socially transmitted, including customs, traditions, and language. So this includes not only the customs, traditions, and language of doctors, nurses, and therapists, but those of patients and families, and the other individuals who work within the many settings of our healthcare system. Here are some photographs which illustrate what we are talking about. All of these were taken by researchers studying the information behavior of healthcare professionals in typical healthcare settings. At top left is a critical care nurse working with a three-ring binder paper-based medical chart, a labeled bottle of a type of IV medication, a large spreadsheet of patient data, and a small yellow blank sheet of paper for personal notes. She appears to be using all these information objects at the same time. At top right is a primary care doctor using a mouse to navigate an electronic medical record on an exam room computer while in her lap is a partly unfolded paper-based medical record. You can see that her fingers are inserted at various places in the paper record, acting as some kind of bookmarks, perhaps to help her keep her place. At bottom right are three stacks of patient records in an old paper-based format. One stack is about 6 inches high, another is about 12 inches high, and the third could be 18 inches high. Large rubber bands hold together the green folders full of patient information. You can tell at a glance simply by the thickness of these records that these patients likely have large and complex medical histories. Finally, at bottom left is a photograph from an intensive care unit. In the foreground are two physicians, and in the background are several nurses. All of them are looking down towards some kind of record on the counter, while around them are numerous computers. What you cannot tell from the still photograph is the significant level of background noise and the constant motion of the people working in this setting. 
These are just some simple examples of the sorts of observations we can make in the field and then inquire about to learn more about the language, behaviors, traditions, and customs of people who work in the healthcare system. A brief survey of what is retrieved when searching Google, Google Scholar, and the National Library of Medicine's Medline database using the search terms culture of healthcare returns four basic themes. First is the culture of patients. There is a great deal of discussion about the cultural diversity of patients cared for in the healthcare system and the need to consider each patient's ethnic, national, racial, and religious backgrounds when providing their health care. Second is the culture of the healthcare workforce. There is discussion of workplace diversity and the need to collaborate effectively with others of diverse national, ethnic, and religious backgrounds. Third is the culture of organizations, including discussion of safety culture, organizational culture, a culture of innovation, measuring culture, and the like. Fourth is the culture of professions, including the professional culture of nurses, physicians, surgeons, traditional and alternative healers, and other health care providers. When we talk about the culture of patients, most of the contemporary literature discusses either problems with the inequities in health care that is received by persons of other cultures, or the need to understand and adjust to the beliefs and values of specific cultures who encounter the health care system. Inequities in health care are the result not only of social economic factors which make health care less accessible but also the result of differences in language and the concepts and models of illness. Individuals dealing with our healthcare system who come from another culture and speak another language have a potential problem of understanding that reaches deeper than just language. In many cases, their concepts of illness and the cause of diseases are fundamentally different, so the translation of language alone is not sufficient. These differences can mean that clinicians may not understand the patient, and the patient may not understand the clinician, with the result that the appropriateness or effectiveness of care may be threatened. Much is being written of late about cultural competence and the need for culturally sensitive care. Large organizations such as healthcare systems must train their workforce in order to deliver appropriate and culturally sensitive care to all who present themselves. Modern urban hospitals with the great cultural diversity of cities are not the only institutions that must address these issues. Many small or critical access hospitals and small clinics in rural areas are also likely to encounter significant cultural diversity in their patient populations and workforce populations, although the resources available to address these may be fewer. There are many categories of these differences and cultural variations that can lead to problems with effective communication and appropriate care. Some are based on geography, such as Southeast Asian or African American. Some are based on religious differences, such as the Hmong or Islam. Others are based on differences of language, such as spoken Spanish, including geographic variations in Spanish, or Telugu, or ethnic or cultural differences, such as the Romani or Gypsy people. And there are also other special groups whose beliefs and values must be considered, such as street culture, adolescent culture, and the like. Each of the groups that we have mentioned may have specific beliefs, values, or practices that must be understood when encountered in our healthcare system if we are to deliver effective health care. We refer to this as cultural competence, or an awareness of and respect for cultural differences. It is especially important in this regard to avoid cultural stereotypes that may or may not apply to a given individual, and to not assume that because a person belongs to a particular cultural group that they uniformly share and adhere to some stereotype about that group's beliefs. Some specific issues that need to be considered include things like traditional beliefs about transfusions or vaccines and modesty issues when conducting a physical exam. The bottom line is each person has to be approached as an individual, 
there is no cookie-cutter approach. We can adopt this same notion of cultural competence in our dealings with other groups in the healthcare system. When we think about the healthcare workforce, it is easy to bring with us stereotypes about different health professionals and their behaviors. A second theme found in surveying healthcare deals with the culture of the healthcare workforce. This includes issues such as cultural diversity of work groups, including nursing, issues relating to the culture of physicians, especially gender, race, and ethnicity. The cultural diversity of international medical graduates trained elsewhere in the world who come to the United States to practice, and the impact of the culture of these health professionals on patient care. In this brief lecture, there is not time to discuss all of these issues, though many of them may become apparent or important as your study of the culture of healthcare continues in other units. One area that is receiving increasing attention with the current emphasis on medical errors and patient safety is the concept of just culture. This concept of just culture is more easily understood when contrasted with the blame culture that sometimes exists in organizations and that can interfere with organizational learning and improvement. What we refer to as the blame culture is characterized by a high degree of organizational rigidity and an emphasis on strict compliance with existing practices. A blame culture can occur unintentionally in an organization that is overly rigid and rule-oriented, and when there is a focus on assigning blame to individuals for system failures. The result for members of such organizations is fear of punishment a tendency to avoid risk, and distrust. The predominant response to an error or near misses becomes silence because workers are afraid to come forward. Contrast this with the just culture, which is characterized by an organizational learning culture, by an environment in which members believe it is okay to question existing practices and where management expresses openness to worker input. Such environments have an overall commitment to quality. Ideally, this culture will lead to uninhibited reporting of problems, extensive information sharing about problems, and organizational response that follows up with remediation directed not at removing offending individuals, but on improving processes or execution through staff training and the like. In healthcare, a just culture means that healthcare workers believe they are safe to report problems and question practices, and that they are invested in quality improvement. A third common theme in the literature on culture and healthcare is concern with the culture of organizations. Much is being written about desirable properties in organizations, such as a culture of innovation or a culture of health, as in employee wellness. In healthcare settings, organizational culture is often concerned with maintaining a culture of privacy with regard to patient health information, a culture of cost effectiveness, and a culture of safety. This interest in organizational culture has led to a great deal of research on understanding and measuring culture, in particular measuring for the presence of a safety culture and understanding the process of culture change, which has obvious relevance to the introduction of major disruptive changes, such as new health information technology. Safety culture has received a great deal of attention as it relates so strongly to not only workforce safety, such as fewer needle sticks and other on-the-job injuries, but also because it is so important for patient safety. This slide lists some features of a safety culture in an organization. First, safety culture is a concept defined at the group level, referring to shared values among all members of the group. Second, safety culture is concerned with formal safety issues in the organization, including its management and supervisory systems. Third, safety culture emphasizes the contribution from everyone at every level of the organization. And fourth, safety culture has an impact on members' behavior at work, and it is usually reflected in a relationship between reward systems and safety performance. 
safety culture, as we discussed in a previous slide, is reflected in an organization's willingness to develop and learn from errors, incidents, and accidents. Finally, safety culture, when present, should be relatively enduring, stable, and resistant to change. In healthcare, evidence suggests that a climate of safety exists when many elements are working together, including management commitment to safety, explicit safety practices and behaviors in the organization, safety knowledge and training programs among the membership, safety communication, and safety equipment and supplies. These factors are indicators that the climate of safety exists and when working together can improve patient safety. The fourth major theme in literature on the culture of healthcare is the culture of health professions or the beliefs, values, and practices of the professions themselves. Much of the literature discusses comparisons of Western biomedicine or allopathic medicine to other traditions such as osteopathic medicine as well as to complementary and alternative medicines, such as traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, naturopathic, or homeopathic practice. These healthcare practice traditions differ not only in the treatments and interventions they provide, but in the underlying belief systems about the causes and consequences of illness on which those treatments are based. Also prominent in the literature on healthcare culture are discussions of the cultures which are specific to individual professions, such as nursing culture or physician culture. Nursing may be characterized, for example, as a holistic and caring profession. Physicians may be characterized as being focused on diseases, expressing a benign paternalism, and placing great importance on autonomy. Closer examination reveals that the culture of health professionals is often more fine-grained than that, with differences between the culture of surgical practice compared to medical practice, or differences among the distinct cultures of critical care units, operating rooms, and emergency rooms. The closer we look at the culture of health care, the more cultures we find. The culture of biomedicine includes more than just the professional cultures of nurses, physicians, and other health professionals. Modern healthcare settings also include the relatively distinct cultures of management, business, and information technology, or IT. We can get a sense of the differences that exist between these interacting cultures from their language. For example, consider the words used to refer to the individuals that these groups serve. From the business point of view, they are customers. From the IT point of view, they are users. From the librarian's point of view, they are patrons. To counselors and therapists, they may be considered clients. While to most doctors and many nurses, they are referred to as patients. Each of these terms may be used for the same individual when interacting with different parts of the healthcare system, and the terms imply differences in underlying assumptions about their relationships. To summarize, based on this brief survey of contemporary literature about the culture of healthcare, we can make the following observations. First, most of this literature is about other cultures, that is, one culture describing another. Less often, it is about any particular culture describing itself. This is consistent with the notion that one's culture is transparent, that is, the culture you do not notice is your own. We will talk more about that in the next lecture of this unit. Second, this brief survey shows us that there are an enormous number of resources available to learn more about these various cultures of healthcare, which are easily found on the Internet. Third, these discussions bring up the question of acculturation. We usually think about acculturation with respect to an individual moving from one culture to another and adopting or adapting to the language, beliefs, and practices of that culture. This happens, for example, when a person moves from the United States to another country or vice versa. We can also think about acculturation with respect to individuals who move from outside the healthcare system into the healthcare system and must adopt or adapt to the beliefs and practices and language of the healthcare system.
This happens, of course, when IT professionals or others move from outside the healthcare system and must become acculturated to it. This concludes Lecture A of the Culture of Healthcare, an overview of the culture of healthcare. In summary, the main points of this lecture are Culture as it is used in relation to healthcare has many meanings that are relevant to healthcare and health information technology. Healthcare takes place in a complex mix of cultures, including professional and organizational. Culture is not apparent from within, as it is taken for granted by its members, though differences may be obvious to outsiders, and we can work more effectively when we are made aware of these differences. And finally, cultural competence can be applied not only to the interaction of health professionals with their patients, but also to the interactions between IT professionals and the healthcare system. It becomes evident that one job of biomedical informatics professionals is to bridge these cultures and translate across the boundaries. We can do this by learning more about the healthcare culture, which is the subject of the second lecture in this Introduction to Healthcare Culture.